Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Tuesday, October the 10th, 2017. Towergate Day 217. Thank you so much for tuning in. I do have some news, uh, a little bit of news today on the Las Vegas shooting and Mr. Paddock. But before I do, let's go ahead and go through some of the Towergate news, some things that we haven't been covering the last two or three days because of the Las Vegas story. So let's go ahead and get with that right now and uh, we'll get to the some Las Vegas stuff at the end. Alrighty, well, it appears that Trump has defeated the NFL kneelers. No question about it. You are seeing far fewer players taking a knee. You now have the uh, head of the Dallas Cowboys and the Miami Dolphins both saying that any player that takes a knee will not play. We had Mike Pence walking out of the Indianapolis Colts game when a couple of players knelt there. We can see that there uh, have been a lot of um, ads pulled, a lot of sponsors canceling contracts with players starting to add up. And it's just a matter of time before the league has to come out and change their policy. That is coming. Watch very carefully because that's what's coming next. So Trump has defeated the NFL kneelers and uh, it's just as many of us predicted what happened. You know, the money talks and the money is talking loudly and the NFL is listening. Well, some interesting news uh, from Chuck Ross today. Uh, he's reporting that the Senate Judiciary Committee chair uh, has sent a letter to former FBI or to current FBI director Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray regarding the dossier. And now this is kind of interesting. It's going down a slightly different road. Mr. Grassley is basically saying, among other things, he is asking Christopher Ray about the possibility that the dossier allegations about the collusion between Trump's associates and the Russians, he's wondering if they were serotypously funneled from foreign intelligence agencies by U.S. intelligence agencies. What he's basically saying here is that he has learned, Senator Grassley, his committee, the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, looking at the dossier, has learned that Christopher Steele shared some information, if not all the information, if not the whole dossier, with British intelligence. And so Grassley is asking about the communications or contact between British intelligence or any other foreign intelligence agency with the CIA or the FBI. The point that he's getting at is was the, he knows for sure, Grassley knows for sure that the wiretap on Carter Page was a result of the dossier. And so what Grassley wants to know is whether or not the FBI or the CIA had gotten information from British intelligence, which of course it would come from Christopher Steele. And the reason why that's important is because these intelligence agencies do share a lot of information. And if the FBI or the CIA was getting this information from British intelligence, they might look at it as something to be taken seriously. Because generally, intelligence agencies don't share information unless they're pretty sure it's good information. So what Grassley is suggesting is that British intelligence got this information from Christopher Steele and then they shared this information with U.S. intelligence or possibly the FBI or someone else. And so that's the question that Charles Grassley is asking Christopher Wray in this letter. He's wanting to know the source of the intelligence that the FBI or CIA or both relied on as they made their case to get the surveillance warrant on Carter Page. And the reason he's digging down on this is because you can, at the very least, seriously embarrass the FBI, James Comey, anyone else who was involved, Loretta Lynch, the AG, possibly the CIA, although Brennan's playing dumb uh, throughout this whole time. But the idea is you can make them look very, very bad by suggesting that they used this information that they got from British intelligence to get the surveillance warrant. Charles Grassley, the point that he's driving at here is he is trying to call into question the 
legitimacy. Of course, we already know that the dossier is not legitimate, but he's calling into credit. He's calling the credibility of the FBI or the Justice Department. He's calling them out and wanting to know if it was British intelligence or exactly where they got this intelligence that made them want to go get the surveillance warrant on Carter Page. So he's drilling down on this particular point. Now obviously he's got somewhere else he's wanting to go with this. But I think he wants to get the FBI or Christopher Ray or the Justice Department on record. He wants to get them on record of where they got that intelligence. He's tried to get it the other way, going the other route, by asking probably Glenn Simpson, by of course trying to get the information from Christopher Steele, and he's tried other ways to try to get at it. So it looks like this is just another way that Charles Grassley is trying to get at the source of who made the decision to launch the surveillance on Carter Page and whether or not that was based on intelligence that they got directly from Fusion GPS, Christopher Steele, whether he shared it personally, or whether it was British intelligence. And the point here is at the very least he's going to cause some embarrassment. But he's trying to get the truth about where exactly um, how this dossier got into Comey's hands. Of course we know McCain gave it to him, but at what point did they make a decision that the intelligence was good, good enough to go for a surveillance warrant on Carter Page. Because if they cannot produce that, or if what they try to produce is ridiculous, then what it does is it makes it makes certainly makes it look like the entire thing was a setup on the Trump team. It makes it look like these were just excuses that they could use to get the warrants. And that's really what Grassley is trying to get at. He's trying to get at, remember, when you go launch a surveillance warrant through the FISA court on somebody, you better have some pretty good information. And this is what Grassley is trying to get at. He's um, he's wanting to test the, uh, <laughs> the, le the, the legitimacy of the request to get the FISA warrant and once he gets that far then he can begin drilling down and you can expect that they'll want to talk to Comey, Loretta Lynch and other people and find out because this is ultimately where Grassley is trying to go is he's trying to show that this entire thing was a political operation and not an intelligence operation at all and the way to do that is to blow up the intelligence and be able to prove that it was not verified that it was not solid intelligence and that it may have even been set up. So this is how he's trying to drill around it to get to the point where he's trying to go. And Christopher Ray probably understands that, but um, you know, you got to appreciate the angles he's taken to get there. And he, you know, you got to admire uh, Mr. Grassley for continuing to uh, probe around the edges. He's not walking away and giving up and throwing up his hands. He's just going at different angles, trying to get the answers to these questions, because ultimately that is what is at the end of his questions. When you get to the end of that road, it is the it is the idea that he's trying to show whether or not this was a political operation that was being run on the Trump team, or was this real intelligence? And of course we know they're going to have a very difficult time making the case that it was real intelligence. That's exactly what Grassley is trying. He's going to try to make them admit to something that's completely crazy or admit to something that shows uh, criminal conduct. You've got two, two choices. You can either admit to criminal conduct or you can admit to being a complete idiot. <laughs> it's kind of putting him in that situation. And you can bet that he'll be following that up with the uh, in the Justice Department as well. So uh, this thing may drag on for months and months and months, but eventually, hopefully, we'll get to the end of this road. And um, hopefully what we all know, which was that it was a political espionage operation by the Obama administration used against the Trump team. Uh, we all know that's what this was. Grassley knows what, that's what this was. Everybody knows that's what this was. It's just that you got to, uh, 
work on these people to try to crack that nut. And uh, the FBI, Christopher Ray, even though he wasn't a part of it, he doesn't want to embarrass his agency. The Justice Department doesn't want to be embarrassed, and that's probably why Sessions is probably not interested in cooperating. So at the very least, there's a lot of embarrassment that could be had, possible even incompetence. But I think most people know it goes beyond that, and I think Grassley knows it goes beyond that, because you can only you can only plead incompetence to a point. It's kind of hard for Loretta Lynch and, and, and Comey and all these people to plead complete ignorance and stupidity when everyone knows that they're not totally ignorant and stupid. They're just corrupt as hell. And they were engaged in a political operation to sabotage the Trump campaign, then the Trump presidency. That's where all this is going. And Charles Grassley is hammering away at the perimeter, <laughs> trying to find the right angle to get in and blow this thing up. That's exactly what he's doing. Well, you know, Fox News ran a story uh, uh, that uh, Stephen Paddock was a moderate gambler and never drank alcohol. <laughs> yes, and this uh, came from a source that apparently was uh, someone who served VIP members at the MGM, and he and it is a part of his uh, his uh, expose, I guess. He's saying, yeah, well, he served it, you know, um, uh, Mr. Paddock. And his, and his uh, girlfriend there for two years. Well, the only problem with that is, is that we know that he just met this woman back in the spring of 2017, March or April of 2017. So this couldn't possibly be true. He couldn't have been serving Paddock and his girlfriend for two years when in fact they had only been together for uh, seven, eight, nine months. So I wouldn't put any stock in this, particularly when you've had two or three other publications, including the Daily Caller, which is known for a pretty solid journalist over there, as well as uh, independent journalist Laura Loomer, who spent the entire week on the ground in Las Vegas, going into all those hotels, talking to all those barmaids, talking to all those uh, car dealers, talking to all those people who service the members. And she was told over and over and over again, as well as other journalists who've been there, um, I believe Cernovich is, is, uh, had contacts there, and everybody is hearing the same thing, that this guy was a hardcore alcoholic, drank from morning to, well, actually drank from night to morning because he was a night owl. He liked to sleep in the day, uh, usually with quite a bit of medication to get him to sleep, and then he would get up at night, you know, around 10, 11 o'clock at night, and then he would go to the casino, and apparently he liked to gamble and drink all night long and then sleep all day. This is apparently, was his routine. He also frequented several prostitutes. One is coming out now and telling all sorts of stories about him. So it is hard to know at this point. Uh, you have to just trust the source. If it's coming from the mainstream pipeline, you can bet it's CIA propaganda. And the point here is to simply throw out so much information, and particularly information that contradicts other information, to put so much out there that it just clouds the view, muddies the water to the point where people just throw up their hands and go, look, ha, ah, he's an alcoholic. He's not a, he doesn't even drink. Uh, he's a crazy sex maniac. No, he's a quiet, gentle man. He's a great brother and son. Oh, no, no, no. He was a, he was a, he was a hack. You know, the idea is to get you with uh, so many different pieces of propaganda in your head that you can't tell up from down, left from right, or what's up to get you confused, to get you chasing your tail, to get people going off in a million different directions on all these little stories. But these are all being pipelined directly into the corporate media. So my recommendation is trust the independent media journalist who survive, in many cases, on their donations and uh, things like that, as opposed to the corporate media. Uh, we know how they survive by huge, huge money. Uh, and Wall Street and the military industrial complex and all the others, all these people backing them. And we know about the many, many decades long relationship between the CIA and the corporate media. And some people I know, they like to watch Fox. They think Fox is legit. Fox is not legit. Fox is, you know, sometimes uh, they, they're on the right side because they're kind of the con so-called conservative, but they're really neoconservatives more than anything else. But when it comes to deep state, things like that, they fall in line, just like everybody falls in line. So my suggestion is uh, 
with so much information out there, just keep in mind that you are being bombarded with massive amounts of disinformation coming directly pipelined in from the intelligence community. This is how they operate. And it is hard to tell what's real news and what's fake news. Uh, but I would say trust the independent uh, journalist, uh, trust independent people and uh, independent journalists who've actually gone there, canvassed the neighborhood, been on the ground, talked to people. Uh, don't believe the corporate media. They will only lead you astray and get you going in a thousand different directions and you'll just be more and more confused by the day and you'll understand less and less what happened. Don't lose sight of the most important facts and keep pushing for the facts because we still don't really have them. This is an investigation that's just now getting started. They're in the very early stages. Remember, there are many, many things to be investigated. I covered this two videos ago. We still have the toxicology. We still have the ballistics report. We still have a lot of information that needs to come out. But as you can see, and one way you can always tell when you're witnessing a government cover-up operation is that as soon as the crime occurs, no matter how large the crime is, they'll be out there with the narrative within two or three hours of the event and they'll just keep pushing the narrative even before they've completed the investigation and as everyone knows just from living in your own community when you have a crime the police are very very hesitant to say anything uh, and especially to arrive at any formed conclusion they can say we suspect this we think this we believe this but they generally won't come out and essentially be giving you the absolute facts telling you this is the gospel within hours or even a couple of days of an event they always wait for the investigation to be done. Once the investigation is done, then at that point they don't come out and say, well, we think this, we believe this. At that point they come out and say, this is you know, what happened, this is what, our, you know, this is what it suggests. And keep in mind, there are thousands of witnesses that need to be interviewed. Thousands, including lots of cops. We've heard, uh, uh, we need the toxicology, the ballistics, we need to have the acoustics done. There's many, many different things in this investigation that needs to be done. And once it is all done, this needs to be made available to the public, including the photos of the crime scene, where we should see somewhere between 800 and 1,000 spent shell casings. Between 800 and 1,000, if they say that he was the only shooter, Mr. Paddock, if he was the only shooter, and all the shots were fired from room 135 on the 32nd floor at the Mandalay Hotel, then we should see the two weapons or the weapons that are responsible, and that will be known from the ballistics test, what rifles fired what rounds that killed and injured what people. We will have that information, and we'll also have the crime scene photos. And keep in mind, the shooter's nest was a crime scene, and in that crime scene, we should see between 800 and 1,000 spent cartridges. They should have an exact count of spent cartridges. They should have an exact count. This investigation should take at least six months to a year, six months minimum, probably a year. They should wait till they interview all the witnesses, wait till they get back the coroner's report, wait till they get back the ballistics report, wait till they have someone come in and uh, conduct acoustic research. All these things need to be done before they should be coming out and telling us what happened. Yet, as you can see, within a couple hours we got the narrative, and now they're feeding that narrative, and now they're flooding the airways with disinformation. This is how cover-ups work. This is how the deep state works. This is why they usually get away with it. But I expect that there'll be lots of people already, probably, uh, preparing their freedom of information requests. This is not something that has to do with national intelligence or anything like that, secret intelligence, nothing like that. This was a crime on American soil. They're not telling us it had anything to do with Al-Qaeda. They're not telling us it had anything to do with ISIS. Some people are suggesting that as part of the propaganda or people who have that kind of an agenda. But the uh, law enforcement certainly hasn't proven anything in that, that regard. And so therefore, all this information should be public domain. All this information should be available through the public records. This is what we'll be waiting for. We may be waiting for a while, but we'll be waiting. Well, Natalia Veselnaskaya, the Russian lawyer who met with Manafort and uh, Jared Kushner and Trump Jr., along with the two Russians that we talked about uh, two days ago, 
Apparently, Vessel Niskaya has just done an interview with NBC News, one of the fake broadcast outlets, corporate outlets, and she said that the conversation and the purpose of the meeting was simply about the Magnitsky Act. She wanted to talk to Donald Trump Jr. about the Magnitsky Act so that he could talk to his father and see if he could persuade him to support overturning the Magnitsky Act. She said it had nothing to do with Hillary. She had no dirt on Hillary. And she says that she was not working for the Russian government. So now this is literally just about everybody has been interviewed who was in that meeting. And this is what they all say happened. Everyone says this is what happened. Keep in mind, this meeting was used also to gain surveillance on Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort. This meeting was used for that purpose. Now let's see about some other questions. Now this interview I don't think is aired yet, but once it does, I'll be watching. I want to know if fake MSNBC or fake NBC News is going to ask Vessel Naskaya about that waiver that she was given, very special waiver that she was given by Preet Bahara, the district attorney in New York, the U.S. attorney in New York, which he was apparently ordered to do by the Attorney General Lynch. We'll see if they ask any questions about that. We'll see if they ask her any questions about the meeting uh, that, that she had or that the fact that she visited and took a photo from Senator Magoo's office. We'll, we'll see if they ask her about the donation that she received from Senator Magoo's PAC. We'll see if they ask her anything about her relationship with Fusion GPS and Glenn Simpson. We'll see if they ask her any information, any questions about her association with Mr. Goldstone. Do you think that MSNBC asked any questions about any of that? Something tells me they didn't, but we'll watch the interview just to see, because those certainly would have been the top questions on my mind. Twitch McConnell is now defending Bob Corker in his feud with Trump. Well, we talked about Bob Corker about two weeks ago. He's one of the Republicans that decided he's not going to run for re-election, and he's been in this verbal battle with Trump. Now, the funny thing is, is that back when Trump was having people visit Trump Tower back during the time when he had won the Republican nomination, and uh, even after that, no, it was after that, it was after he won the presidency, and he was interviewing people uh, for cabinet positions and things and such. Mr. Corker called to request a meeting with Trump. And of course, Trump shot him down. Trump had nothing for him. Trump didn't offer him anything. And he told him that day. He said, well, you know, thanks for stopping by. But I do want you to know, just want to be honest with you, I'm not planning on offering you anything. And it was at that point that, that, that Corker uh, turned on Trump, really. And of course, he's been a thorn in his side ever since, and he's probably going to try to cast a vote uh, to stop the uh, tax reform bill, if he can, as one last dig at Trump before he goes. Now, it appears that there's something else going on with Mr. Corker. It appears that he may be involved in a little uh, insider trading through a REIT, a real estate investment trust that he has set up. Now, for those of you who don't know, members of Congress are allowed to do insider trading obviously by the fact that they vote on legislation and they have information uh, that has to do with who's going to get funding and who's going to get money and you know various sorts of things that affect stock, uh, that they can use this information to buy stock. And of course, we know many politicians, people say, how do they make you know, 150 grand a year and, and leave their multimillionaires? Well, it's because they are allowed to do insider trading. They're allowed to take information that they learn as members of Congress and use that uh, to uh, make stock projections and stock picks and stock buys and stock sells and, and put options and things like that. So I'm not sure. Now, they don't have total carte blanche. I mean, there are still some regulations and rules on that. They're not allowed to spread this information. They're not allowed to pass this information on. They're not allowed to contact their agent or anything like that. Uh, so there are some restrictions as to how they can use the information that they have. But, and I think that this is probably where Corker may be in trouble, but we're learning now that he is under FBI investigation 
And maybe that's why he wanted to be a member of Trump's cabinet, maybe of the VP slot, because maybe he was thinking if he could get a VP slot or something like that, that he could effectively kill any investigation into his insider trading. And apparently there's some other people caught up in this as well. So this may start to explain why Bob Corker is not seeking re-election. I think he knows that he's got some issues coming up, possibly legal issues. It looks like Imran Awan wiped his cell phone four hours before his arrest. Someone tipped him off. We've been talking about this now for weeks and weeks. Someone was tipping Imran Awan off. Someone was giving him information. And I don't know that Debbie Blabbermouth Wasserman Schultz had that intel. We're talking about information about the investigation. I mean, was the FBI calling up Debbie Blabbermouth Wasserman Schultz and keeping her abreast of this information? No, she was part of the probe. She was part of the person being investigated. So who in the Justice Department or FBI was communicating with Imran Awan? Clearly, he was getting tipped off. No doubt about it. No question about it. He was getting tipped off and we now learn that he wiped his cell phone four hours before his arrest. He also had a laptop with him when he was arrested and they got into that laptop and found that it held a resume with an alias. It was a resume for him, but he was using an alias and it was prepared for a company <clears throat> in Bronx, New York. <clears throat> Almost looks like he was getting ready to use another identity and move to Brooklyn and go to work for this company under a alias. <clears throat> Crazy, crazy, crazy thing going on. I imagine I'll keep digging into that, but there's no question they need to be seriously looking at who was tipping off Imran Awan. Clearly, uh, he was getting a lot of information, and I don't think it could have all been coming from Blabbermouth Wasserman Schultz. I don't think she would have been kept abreast of, of, of this type of stuff. I don't think she was pipelined into that. Someone at the Justice Department uh or at the FBI was definitely tipping off Imran Awan. No question about it. Of course, we now have Twitch McConnell defending Bob Corker in his feud with Trump. Well, that shouldn't surprise any of us. Looking at Twitch McConnell's approval ratings, he's not up for re-election, <clears throat> but good old Bob's his friend. Hey, maybe Twitch is caught up in this scandal with Bob. Maybe Bob dragged Twitch into his little scheme. It's really hard to know. <clears throat> of course, now we have Stephen Paddock's brother. It appears that the interview, the, in, the FBI has gone back and interviewed him a second time. He's quite the interesting character, isn't he? Quite the interesting character, and I think it's pretty obvious that he's not telling the whole truth. He's covering for his brother, and I don't blame him for that, but it's obvious it's obvious to the FBI, certainly at this point, that he is not exactly uh, coming clean, I guess you would say. So they've gone back for a second interview. We don't know what's come of that, but we know that they did go back for a second interview of Mr. Paddock's brother. Of course, we have the rotten Reverend Clinton. Uh, she still has not come out and um, said anything about her close relationship with her good friend and huge donor, Harvey Weinstein. He's the money man for all that Hollywood money that flowed into the Rotten Reverend's campaign, as well as his own personal contributions of millions of dollars. And isn't it interesting how the Rotten Reverend, she's connected to all these men who are perverts. Her husband, her chief of staff, Huma Abedin, her husband is a now a convicted pervert on his way to jail. <clears throat> we have <clears throat> now Mr. Weinstein, obviously a longtime pervert. And probably, I mean, Podesta's a pervert. Uh, all these people around the Rotten Reverend, the pervs. She surrounds herself with men who have reputations as being womanizers, perverts, rapists, God knows what else. My dad used to say, birds of a feather flock together. CNN, <laughs> CNN's own poll how embarrassing for CNN. Boy, they're a disaster. CNN's own poll shows the vast majority of majority of people agree with Trump 
on immigration policy. <clears throat> That's hard to believe on CNN. But it's true. Of course, we have an anchor on MSNBC blasting the rotten Reverend Clinton for staying silent on the Harvey Weinstein situation. Everyone knows how close they are. But apparently this journalist on, or this host on MSNBC is saying that it's making all of us look like hypocrites. Well, when you count on the rotten reverend, you lose. You lose when you count on the rotten reverend Clinton and her pervert husband. You lose every time. Expecting the rotten reverend to come out and diss Mr. Weinstein? Hell no, she's married to a pervert. Her chief of staff's husband is a convicted pervert. Her campaign manager is a pervert and God knows what else. Diane, turn in your guns, Mr. and Mrs. America Feinstein admits that she once had a concealed carry permit, but now she says she doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> she has also announced that she's running for re-election. We're learning that George Soros uh, put a made a put option bet against Mandalay Bay MGM Grand Hotels last quarter. George Soros was betting on the stock at Mandalay and, and uh, MGM would go down. He knew last quarter, for some reason, something was going to happen was to make their stock go down. Of course, the shocking, the new shock poll, the NFL is now the least liked sport. It went from being the best liked sport two years ago to now being the least liked sport. And the core fans, core fans, viewership is down 31%. Julian Assange says that all terrorist attacks are orchestrated by the FBI. Can't argue with that one. And the final story of the night, I don't know if this is a true story. It's on your newswire, so anything can be your newswire. Sometimes they have legit stories, but they mix in some crazy stuff. But just for your curiosity, I don't know if this is a legit story, but I'll tell you about it. They are reporting that a key eyewitness in the Las Vegas shooting committed suicide. First he killed his daughter, then he committed suicide shortly after he was uh, interviewed by the FBI who raided his home. And this relates to the fact that there was a communication device discovered in Stephen Paddock's hotel room at the Mandalay Bay. This, uh, this uh, communication device is primarily used by special forces and the CIA. The man's name is John Billman. Mr. Bielman was the lead engineer that designed the device. He worked for a company called Ultra Life Corporation in New York. They make communication devices for the Pentagon. Apparently, with his wife in, in the home, the morning after the raid by the FBI, to question him about this device being in uh, Stephen Paddock's hotel room, apparently he goes outside and shoots his daughter and then shoots himself in the back of the head with the 12 gauge shotgun. Must have been a sawed off barrel and the guy must have arms like Gumby. He must be like Inspector Gadget. I wonder if he was Inspector Gadget. John Bielman, he could, he could do the Inspector Gadget routine. Shoot himself in the back of the head with a 12 gauge. Well done. Very well done. This is why I question this story. And of course, finally, it's being reported by all the uh, mainstream media outlets today. The Mandalay Bay security guard, who's being described as a hero, is now we're now learning was shot before the massacre began. Again, a million different pieces of information that will get you going a million different ways. But this is how things work in the deep state. Towergate, day 217, October 10th, 2017. Tuesday. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. Guys, have a good night. Bye.